Okay, so um, so yeah, why do we want to spend time introducing each other? I think that's actually I think a quite big part of this uh, component of this workshop is we concentrate people with the same uh, mindset and same um, uh, same interest to, to, together, so we can know each other and move this field forward. It's a very young field, and there's not much solid knowledge about it, but um, if we know our colleagues, and you can hear from, from everyone that we are from a diverse group investigating different parts of the biology, but we all wanted to use this technology, and it's sometimes good to have someone talk to when we are faced with challenges and stuff. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Um, uh, what what this class is about? So it's an introduction. No, it, it's an invitation to spatial transcriptomics. So what's the difference? Um, so introduction, I think, carries with some connotation that there is an expert in the field, which is supposedly me, that will teach you some knowledge about this field I'm familiar with, and uh, you will learn something solid from me. But I don't think that's as accurate as an invitation, which I know a little bit more, and maybe because I have more experience with uh, data and closer to, to a lab with actually doing this, but because it's a young field and um, um, and it, it requires a lighter <laughs> responsibility on myself, but more engagement on you guys, actually. Um, and so you, you will see in, 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 in a few minutes that uh, it requires a Find some effort from yourself to, to solve some puzzles. But uh, I'm here to help you and you will not be solving those puzzles alone. Um, so what, what is a spatial transcriptomics? Uh, so this is a nice review from Leo Patcher's lab called the Museum of Sp uh, Spatial Transcriptomics published uh, this year. Uh, this figure just shows uh, uh, as a uh, as the number of uh, as the year pat went on, the number of publications in this field just explodes. It, it takes off at around 2015, then it, it just explodes uh, recently. And I think we are still in the early phase of using it to solve parts of the biology. So it's a rapidly uh, rapidly uh, developing field, and that implies everything learned here will soon be obsolete. <laughs> Uh, that's part in part two, maybe, I don't know, uh, but uh, not so much because the elements will be reshaped and rearranged to create new things and the fundamentals hopefully uh, will be carried over in the future. And also, um, I like, I, here's a quote from uh, from a theoretical physicist who, who, who deceased uh, last year or so, if I remember correctly, uh, Stephen Weinberg. Uh, he once wrote in science uh, a very brief but beautiful uh, article called uh, Four Golden Lessons that summarize his scientific career. One of his lessons is go for the messes. That's where the action is. So this field is actually where the messes are and where the action is ongoing. And uh, it's a great, I think, uh, field to dive in um, now at, uh, so that you can embrace uh, what's happening next. So what's the goal of this workshop? So after this workshop, obviously you will not become an expert in spatial transcriptomics. I don't claim myself to be one, but you will have jumped into the deep water of it, either swimming or thinking. But even if you're thinking, it's not a big deal. It's not a life-threatening one or anything. You just go find something else to do. All right, so housekeeping things, recording we mentioned, coding environment will be code uh, in Python using this uh, Google Collaboratory that hosts Jupyter Notebook. You can also use your own Jupyter Notebook. You have set it up already. It's, uh, Google Collaboratory is just a, a convenient thing uh, to use if you don't have any prior knowledge about how to use Python, how to install a package and stuff like that. Grading, so how many people will be graded? Uh, uh, in this class, uh, I see one hand, uh, maybe some of you online as well. I, I don't think many people, but if you need to be graded, uh, grading is composed of three parts, attendance, uh, if you're here, you already satisfied that, 
um, and take home quiz and homework will be posted uh, tomorrow at the end of the workshop and it's due next Friday. I know it's tight, but the because it's the end of the quarter, it has to be this way. And uh, please ask questions whenever you want it and be interruptive. If I'm too focused on my screen, just yell at me. Um, I don't care about um, uh, uh, being interruptive and, uh, and stuff. It's always good to ask questions. Maybe I'm unclear about something. Maybe I glossed over something I don't understand, but uh, maybe you want to ask some naive question you think, but someone else will thank you later. Uh, although I may not answer all of them. And there will be t shirt tomorrow. I, let me just leave it at that. And Eloy will, will randomly distribute the t shirt to one of you guys. Yeah. Um, components, let me actually shrink this of this workshop. So there will be talks, uh, just me talking, but uh, also reading sessions, which will be more interactive. We will read um, papers on the cutting edge from those inventors. So we see one comment, okay, breaks every hour, yeah. Um, so that's my boss. Um, coding session, uh, we'll be having opportunity for hands-on practice and I'll go around and I'll ask if you have questions, if you need help. And uh, in class, mini quiz, quiz, it's just for discussion and for understanding, and it will not be graded at all and attendance, of course, uh, quiz and homework. It, it, you only worry about that if you need to get a grade. It's it's not going to be something that I will try to trick you. You should be able to complete it uh, uh, in a reasonably short amount of time. And it, it's, it will be a very small component of this workshop, if that makes sense. Um, okay, let's dive it in. Um, what is spatial transcriptomics? So let's just pass the words a little bit. So it's the technologies that make transcripts seen while preserving their spatial information in the cell or tissues, and usually with high throughput. By high throughput, I mean it, this measurement can be done simultaneously on many cells and on many genes uh, at the same time. So uh, transcripts in biology uh, doesn't mean your grade, it means RNA explicitly. Um, RNA is the transcript of DNA, which is the, yeah. It's letting you see the actual RNA. Yes. And then where it was. Exactly. So we'll talk about it in a second. What do we mean by making it seem obviously it's not rigorous scientific language, but it's a good way. So yeah, this is a picture from a paper published a few months ago. It's very fresh right now. So what 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 is this showing? Uh, so some neuroscientists in, the, in this group may immediately recognize it's a section of the mouse brain. It's a sagittal section. Sagittal means if, this, if I'm a mouse, this is my brain. Sagittal means you cut here from to, from to back in this direction, just go here. And yeah, you, and um, each point here is a transcript, is an RNA that belongs to one gene. And it, it's different color means different genes or different kinds of RNA transcripts. Um, and you can see all of them on this tissue and where they are. So that's what we mean by make this transcript scene. And you immediately see that it, it's a beautiful image. It shows a lot of structure. And uh, in particular, it recaptures re a lot of the, I guess, uh, centuries of knowledge developed by uh, uh, modern neuroscientists that will we know about the uh, anatomy of a mouse brain. So from the front to back, so you have a fact uh, factory bulb and this, this layered structure is, is the cortex where higher combination happens. And then down below striatum, salamus, hypothalamus, midbrain, cerebellum, and uh, brainstem, another. Um, so, but um, it's showing this immediately with this 30 genes and you can see different brain regions are enriched in the expression of DNA of different RNA molecules. So, so that's what it is. What, so it's spatial, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, great. Can you explain how the presence of these RNA transcripts lets you conclude that certain cells being upregulated uh, or expressed? Uh, 
so you're asking. So why is the presence of the RNA? Please clarify why the presence of the RNA at a certain location it indicates that a gene is being expressed. Oh, oh, great, great. Uh, so you're asking whether the presence of RNA indicates a gene ex is expressed, right? right. Um, yeah, uh, so I guess we'll talk a bit later. So, um, because we, so the central dogma of uh, biology, I guess, DNA transcripts to genes, the coding region of the DNA transcribed into RNA, and RNAs are used to make those uh, proteins and molecules that perform biological function. So, 30, so me by measuring those RNAs, we know that those genes are being tra actively transcribing those cells in different parts of the brain. So we know they are doing something. And by seeing this relative enrichment of different color, we kind of know different parts of the brain are expressing different genes. Okay. Um, okay, so but so this is what it is, but why do we care? Except that it obviously is a beautiful image and it recaptures the anatomy. So what, what's new here? So many ways to answer the why question, why do we need spatial transcriptomics? One way to think about it is to parse this question and asking the alternative. Why do we care about making RNA scene? Why not just water and lipids, which maybe is more, more there, there are more water in your in, in, in your body than anything else, but obviously it's not interesting because uh, everyone has water carried around and it's not what, uh, what's making the biological functions or actively doing. But why not DNA? Why RNA? Um, that's because um, every cell, so DNA is obviously important, but every cell in our body share the same DNA. So what do we want to look at it? Why do we have so many different cell types? Why neurons are different from muscles? Why different brain regions expresses different genes? So we have so many diverse cell types that function differently and coherently, but they all share the same DNA. It's just the different regions of the DNA are transcribed in different cells in different contexts that we care about in actually performing the function. So why not DNA? Because DNA are shared across everything. So there, there will be people who care about DNA more than RNA, but not in this case. Why not proteins? So we know DNA goes to RNA, RNA make protein, Pre protein carry on to perform, but some RNA also do uh, functions their own. And it's just because um, proteins are harder to probe. That's what I understand. Proteins has higher order structures, secondary structures. Uh, um, uh, in, on the other hand, RNA is just a linear structure with sequences. Yeah. Just a question. So with proteins, yeah. are they more often moved between transported between cells versus RNA is less likely to be? Oh, you're saying yeah. RNA is less likely I, to. I don't know. I don't know either. Uh, but I think the main re people definitely cares about structure. it. If there was a method that allow you to measure a lot of different proteins at the same time, I'm sure people will be excited about it. It's just, I think, transcripts are fundamentally much easier to do. Um, why in cells and in tissues? Why do we want to show the whole mouse brain with its integrity? versus just dissociate cells and measure them in some tubes. Uh, as you can appreciate, you only need the spatial information and the context to understand biology. If you scramble the brain into a dish or something, it's no longer a brain. Um, so, and that also explains why we need high throughput, both in cells and in genes. Why do we need to sample a lot of cells simultaneously? Because if you think about it, the brain functions because you have a large number of neurons talking to each other. It's not a single neuron that matters for how we think and how, what we do. It's a lot of neurons acting together, the same similarity. Why do we need different genes? Because one gene would be great, but different genes would be much better because you know it's, it takes a lot of genes to shape different subtypes. So yeah, that's, that's why we want to see mRNAs in cells and tissues, why we need this. Um, here's an example from the neuroscience community. So um, early on in the last century, the founder of modern neuroscience, Cajal, 
see for, for the first time under his microscope using a then very advanced technology, Golgi staining, which randomly uh, stain brain cells in their entirety so, so you can review the shapes and structures of individual neurons quite clearly as shown in this picture, but without molecular specificity. It's just silver, it just stained morphology. But uh, later on for the last century, we know that diverse cell type is not only represented by their different uh, difference in morphology, in shapes and sizes, but also in their functions, in physiology, in how they respond to uh, electrical signal and stimuli in where they are located in the mouse brain or human brain and where which other brain regions they talk to. And fundamentally, they have different molecular signatures because all cells are molecular machines and their properties are determined by their molecular programs. So molecular diversity underlies morphological, anatomical, functional diversity of brain cells. And so so, so in other uh, tissues as well. We are, we are, and the question obviously uh, we want to address here is how do molecules uh, give rise to in their different proportions, molecule means genes and uh, RNA transcripts, in, um, give rise to diverse cell types that organize themselves to fulfill biologic functions. It's not just the molecule themselves, it's also how they, how they uh, are packed into the cells in different proportions and organize themselves. So, uh, so the same question have can be uh, can take different shapes in different subfields of biology. So in neuroscience, um, people want to know the function. So new um, they want to understand neural circuits. Like in computers, computers are made from electronic circuits that are made. Uh, of transistors, the neurons, uh, and, and in, for the brain, it's neural circuits that serve functions, and neurons are the individual components of it. But what's the molecular logic underlying? Uh, in developmental biology, just a few examples, it's all about how a multicellular organ uh, organism, like we human, are, are derived from one single cell with just tiny bit of DNA, and then they unfold through time and in space into a full body functioning. And what's the molecular logic behind that? What key molecular, what key genes or master regulator were turned on and off in different re uh, developmental uh, trajectories? And for cancer biology, uh, people care about diagnosis and what, what are the biomarkers behind the tumor heterogeneity. Tumors uh, have their underlying molecular underpinnings and we know tumors are different. And you, you can ask, ask these questions on and on. Um, and here are just a few examples. Um, but um, fundamentally, the argument is, uh, I want to make is what's important is not just how diverse the molecules themselves are, but also how they organize to serve functions again. So why it's not only how diverse they are, we, we can compare the genomes. Uh, so E. coli bacteria, prokaryotic cells, very primitive. They have about 4,000 genes, 4,000 different uh, uh, protein coding genes, I think. And then for chicken, there are 17,000. It's more, but not many, too many compared, if you want to compare uh, the complexity between a chicken and a bacteria. And we human has a bit more than a chicken and even less than water flea and less than the, the, the number of genes in rice. So it's not just about how diverse molecules themselves are, it's how they organize. And uh, so Feynman, uh, a physicist once said, uh, what I cannot create, I don't understand. What does it mean? Um, uh, it means, uh, if you grow, we can grow bacteria, but a bag of bacteria never grow into a multicellular organism. Neither do a bag of yeast, neither do uh, a bunch of um, mammalian uh, cells in a dish, which may make grow into a tumor, but never a uh, functional being. Um, that, that, that just means we don't understand enough about biology 
to actually create one. But actually that's more advanced. Uh, we would argue here, what I cannot see, I do not understand. Even before we create something, we need to see what's going on inside. And for a long time, we are constrained by our tools of understanding and seeing what's happening inside uh, living organisms that we take for granted from day to day. So that covers what is spatial transcriptomics and um, why do we care about it? Uh, let me pause here. Uh, any questions uh, so far? You can, uh, for those of you online, if you're, you can also type it in the comment sections if you're uh, inconvenient to speak up whenever um, I'll, I'll check uh, the comments from time to time. So what's the next question? So how does it work, right? So we covered what, we covered why, and how did it work? So uh, how can mRNA molecules uh, be seen? So here's, here's a cartoon uh, which I draw. Um, a cell has a nuclei and mRNA molecules floating around in the cell. Uh, um, obviously the cell is very crowded, uh, packed with uh, mRNAs, other kinds of RNAs, uh, proteins, and other things. It's not just mRNA, but that's what we are focusing on for the moment. Um, how do we make it seem? They they won't they they won't uh, send off light by themselves because they they're just molecules. Um, so we need to engineer to make them seem. Um, so what do we do? One method is by sequencing. At this point, sequencing technology has been quite advanced. So what do we do? We first break the cells, release their mRNAs, and collect them into a tube or in other forms so that those individual mRNA molecules get amplified and put under a sequencing machine, which is by itself pretty advanced. And so we can know the sequence of individual mRNAs we captured. So it could be A, C, T, G, uh, mRNA, U, but whatever. Um, so that's one way. So then because we have the whole genome, we know where this short sequence of mRNA belong to in the genome and we can assign them to the particular gene. So that's one way by sequencing. Um, so there are, advantages and disadvantages of it. So I'll name two. So one is it captured all types of mRNA undiscriminatory, unbiasedly, uh, regardless of which sequence they have, but it lost uh, spatial uh, information because you break the cell apart, you collect their molecules <laughs> into a tube. What else you can, what spatial information you can, you can recover with that. Also, okay, that's one method by sequencing. Um, so another method approach, uh, similarly, here's cell mRNA floating around, is by staining and imaging. So in order to make it seem, we first clear the samples uh, to get rid of other things. And, uh, um, so, uh, and then we design specific probes that themselves are DNA sequence, short DNA oligos that carries with it a fluorophore, which can send, send off light when, when you use other exciting lights to excite it, it'll respond by send, sending light from themselves. And um, these probes are carefully designed in, in, a, in a specific sequence that selectively binds to certain kinds of mRNA molecules. So we know mRNA are letters and uh, they, they can they can bind with each other if the letters match. A matches with T, G matches with C. If you design a short sequence that completely match certain mRNAs in cells, those probes will specifically bind to certain kinds of mRNAs while leave somewhat everything else alone. And then you can wash away the probes and only those bind will remain and then you can image it. So when you do imaging, only those with a fluorophore will send off a signal and where other mRNAs will, <laughs> will not uh, have any signal at all, ideally. So what's, what's good about it? it uh, what's good and bad, I guess, uh, the, uh, compared with previously, uh, now you can only capture one type of mRNA at a time 
uh, because that's constrained by the probes you assigned to the mRNAs, and you only have one color say, for now. Uh, one color represents one unique probe, represents one unique mRNA. And, but it pr preserves spatial information, uh, as you can see, and it can be measured on the tissue section. Um, okay, so that's two methods. Actually, those two methods are the precursors of uh, what we call uh, spatial transcriptomics uh, technology. So two different, two main branches. So just to summarize, one is officially now called uh, single cell transcriptome profiling or single cell RNA seq. So SC means single cell RNA sequencing, um, which can measure almost all the genes unbiasedly with no spatial information at all. And another way is in situ staining. We often call it single molecule fish, SM fish. Fish just means uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization. Uh, anyway, so it's fish uh, means we, we, we use some probes to fish something, um, but it's single molecule, SM. So which measures one or a few genes uh, at a time or while preserving all of the spatial information. So you can see the trends here. What we actually want to have ideally is to be able to measure many genes simultaneously while preserving spatial information. But these two precursors are kind of the stepping stones to the, towards this exciting field we are now the focus. So, but before we talk about um, the actual spatial transformics, let's just dive into the details a little bit more about the precursors, and we'll worry about the spatial transformics soon. So what's what single cell RNA sequencing? I talked briefly how we do sequencing, but let's just go over the workflow a little bit in depth. So you have a tissue section. Here's a mouse brain. You need to dissect the tissues and in order to measure their mRNAs, you need to first dissociate cells individually from their tissues. And you pass the cell through this channel, the microfluidic uh, device, where they meet other barcoded beads. And hopefully that each cell will meet just one bead and each bead you pre-engineered it to carry out a unique DNA barcode a short sequence of DNA that are different for different uh, uh, beads. Then because each cell is captured by one unique uh, bead, and then you later on use some chemistry to dissociate cells and capture their RNAs so that each RNA will stick with it, our unique barcode, short, uh, short DNA molecules. Uh, and then you, you pull everything together and subject to sequencing. So from the sequencing, you get two pieces of information. One is the endogenous signal from the cells, from the mRNAs themselves, uh, originally from the cells. The other is the barcode, the DNA sequence you engineered it to be present that tells you information, to, allows you to separate individual cells from each other. We could, they have, even after you pull them together, pull the RNA molecules from different cells because they each carry a different unique identifier. Um, so that's one approach. And then you, you do sequencing and after sequencing, uh, like I said, uh, the sequence itself contains two information. One is which cell they belong to by matching their unique identifiers. And the, the other is you can map it back to the genome to know which gene they are. So in the end, it's, it gives you a cell by gene matrix and you can do downstream analysis. By the way, um, uh, by analysis, uh, this plot means, um, it, it often referred to as a UMAP plot, a TSNI plot, where each point is a cell and uh, the distance between cells uh, loosely represents the similarity in their gene expression levels across many genes. So if so, if, uh, you see a cloud of cells here, which means they have similar molecular or uh, gene expression level, whereas some cell here has some different programs. They they indicate different cell types. So that's sequencing approach. Um, so the other is. Uh, a single molecule fish, single molecule fluorescent in situ hybridization. Um, 
in situ just means in place, measure everything in the original tissue section. And hybridization means you design a probe to specifically bind to your target. And uh, as I mentioned, so you can design probes. So th these are original mRNAs and you design shorter probes that specifically matches the sequence of those mRNAs and uh, with it uh, fluorophores. So then when you image, you can see those mRNAs that gets bind to your probe. Um, and you can actually do it with many rounds. For each round, you can uh, you, you strip it uh, strip it away uh, the previous round and uh, introduce uh, different kinds of probes that allows you to bind the different genes. So now you can do multiple rounds of imaging, which each round measuring one gene. But you, you cannot hope for more measuring maybe hundreds of genes because if you do 100 rounds of imaging, it's, the tissue is going to be unstable and everything is degraded. But you can measure a few. That's like yeah, any preserves spa uh, um, spatial information. OK, so we are almost at the point of uh, spatial atomics, which, like I said, uh, unifying the best of two words, uh, the uh, tissue histology and the genomics. His uh, tissue histology or staining um, uh, only measure one sample at a time, but spatial transformation allows it to measure more genes in a comprehensive way. And genomics traditionally can measure a lot of genes, but with no spatial information. And so uh, single cell RNA seq, you in single cell RNA seq, you often see this plot where each point is a cell and uh, organized by their a gene expression level, but you have, because you have no spatial information, you don't know which, whether the cell is in this part of the brain or not. On the other hand, you can image the brain and where cells are with no, not, or just a few uh, molecular specificity. But the promise of spatial transatomics is hopefully we can color the uh, anatomical section with their molecular specificity. Uh, uh, that are offered by uh, by by transcriptomics uh, sigma. So that's what we, what we call spatial transcriptomics. Um, so two major uh, branches of technology, as I alluded to, one based on sequencing, one based on imaging. They each take a step forward pr uh, uh, from their precursors. And so for imaging based, today we will learn a merfish, which is a upgrade of single molecule fish we talked about, um, and also something, uh, some other. And for sequencing based, well, we will learn today slide seq, which is an upgrade of single cell RNA seq, if you will. Um, and they each have their inherent advantages and disadvantages. Um, so for this, this is this is another review. So if you originally have a brain section. For imaging based, uh, you can do this. For sequencing based, you can do something else. Um, okay. Um, so what what are the trade offs on the high level? So one thing is to summarize it um, by a different technology by this uh, 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 simple plot, where on the one axis is spatial resolution. How fine grained can you measure things in space? And on the other is the number of genes, uh, how many genes you can measure simultaneously. And then, as we mentioned, on the one hand, you can you have single cell RNA-seq, which measures all genes with no spatial resolution. Uh, on the other hand, you have single molecule fish, which measure one gene at a time on a few with perfect resolution that's needed for biology. Uh, obviously, you can't dive into the atoms, to the quarks, but uh, we don't care about those. Um, but so then uh, slide seek take a step from single cell RNA seq that still measures almost all of the genes, but with sufficient resolution so that you can do a lot of things on it. Uh, about about 50 micron, a, a bit more than 10 micron. So this the size of a cell is about 10 micron. So a bit more than uh, the size of one cell. So you, um, and single merfish take a step from single molecule fish. It has pr preserved all the spatial information we wanted, 
And it allows us to measure a couple hundred genes simultaneously instead of one at a time. That's exciting. And with a couple hundred genes, you can do a lot of things to know what cells are doing. Okay, so how does it work? That's our, the question of next step. But fundamentally, um, there are in, 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 uh, inherent trade-offs between multiplexings or the y-axis and resolutions, as you can see here. And what I didn't mention is also throughput, how many cells you can do with this technology, which is also important. And sensitivity means if there were an mRNA in the, in the tissue, in the cell, how likely you can capture, what percentage you can capture them in, by your measurement. That's all awesome. Um, So with that in mind, uh, I guess uh, I will finish um, the first part of just me talking. And um, um, that's a good uh, fundamental point that allows us to dive into the next topic obviously, which is how does all of those works? Um, and we will take a more detailed look, but um, let's maybe take a five minute break because it's a three hour long workshop. I don't know how long it'll take, but uh, yeah, maybe a five or 10 minute break, depending on, it's also time to ask questions and stuff. Um, so now we are at uh, almost two, Okay, 219, let's uh, resume at 225. Um, thank you. Yes. Could you explain uh, uh, explain the multiplexing? Oh, the multiplexing? Uh, it's it, I mean the number of genes. Okay. Right. So that's what that's a major in place. Yeah. Just, yeah. In place. You can only do that so many times to get into the tissue. Um. Yeah. If you do, you mean if you if you measure one gene at a time and do a hundred. Yeah, will be great. So you need to invent other ways of doing it so that smarter ways of doing it so you can do it uh, without the grid. Yes. Um, so one fundamental limit of imaging is we only have a very short bandwidth of light, which we uh, so. Uh, we know light have different colors. We can presumably using different colors to represent different genes. Right? But there's only a few colors, uh, red and blue, and they bleed into each other. Um, if, say, if you have 10 different fluorophores with 10 different colors, you can capture some of it. Then you can measure 10 genes at a time. So you can push that to about 10 genes, but not 100 <laughs> at, the, at the same time. For to measure 100 genes, you need some fundamentally different so, yeah, that's what we're talking about exactly. Uh, um, also, uh, for those of you online, if you have questions, you can do two things. One is to unmute yourself and speak directly, and the other is to put into the chat. I have a question. Um, this is Mara. Yes. I was wondering, so one thing that like um, we have worked on in our lab is some like multiple uh, multiplex immunofluorescence data, which I know doesn't like sequence the, doesn't actually sequence anything. So I guess it doesn't really get as much resolution like on the expression level. But then I guess, how does that differ from fish in terms of like fish is like fluoroprobes, right? It's fluorescent probes that are added to the mRNA. Why, how is like MIF, I don't know if you know anything about MIF or anything. I was just kind of curious about the differences. Um, uh, let me try to understand your question first uh, because voice yeah. is a little spotty. Um, I think that 
is audio somewhere is not. So how is a single molecule fish different from what? I'll type it in the chat. Oh, it's it'll a, be that, easier. That'll be great. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Uh, Fangling, I had a quick question. Uh, yes, how, go ahead. How does mirrorfish um, compare to the HCR fish? Uh, how, how does mirrorfish reaction? Uh, how does mirrorfish compare to HCR fish? Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Good. Good question. Uh, answer is short. Answer is I don't know. Um, I know pretty uh, quite a lot about mirrorfish. I'm not specifically sure about the HCR fish you mentioned. HCR is an amplification uh, method, is it? Um, or I think yes. I think it multiplex hy hybridization chain reaction in situ. Uh, sorry, uh, can you say it again? It's multiplexed hybridization chain reaction fluorescent. Uh, in situ hybridization. I see, I see, I see. I heard about this, um, but I don't know uh, the details about this technology, sorry. Um, do you have a reference? If you have a reference, you can, uh, yeah, please uh, email me or type it in the chat so we can all take a look at it later. That'll sure. be great. Sure, yeah, it's, it's actually yeah. A, a paper that came out this year, 2022. Um, okay, that's great. That's probably yeah, very fresh I'll, and cutting. I will send it to you. Great, great, great. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Um, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Or if someone in the audience, if you know about this stuff better, yeah, please speak up. Uh, uh, as I said, um, yeah, it's, a, it's more like a, a journal club, a reading club than a class. And, Okay, so we are at 2.25. We still misses one person. Um, so maybe let's wait for one more minute um, and get started. Um, so while we are waiting, so here's a teaser. So, oh, by the way, uh, I think only one person here needs to be graded. Um, I want to check attendance only for those who need the grade. Uh, uh, so there's a Google Sheet. Uh, you don't have to remember this link. I'll send the email to you guys, uh, but ask for your name and email so that you, I know that you have atten uh, attended today. Also, one silly question, and I won't grade that question as well. <laughs> um, so one thing. So here's a, a, a cartoon. So um, fields arranged by purity, which more or less is, is relevant to our topic today. So. Um, on the left, we have sociologists who are looking to the left, and psychologists were saying sociologists just applied psychology because sociology studies a bunch of people together, and psychology study individuals. And then biologists say mind arises from the brain, and in order to psychology is just apply the neuroscience or biology, whatever. And then chemists say uh, all all. All, all living organisms are made of uh, molecules and stuff. And then biology is just applied uh, chemistry. Then uh, go on, you can go on and on. Physicists think everything is physics and mathematicians don't even care about anything. So yeah, that's that captures the arrogance of a lot of scientific topics and how people think about things. When you analyze something, you want to strip it to the core elements. And if you understand its elements, you understand everything, but it's actually far from this. And um, so as a, from a physicist uh, point of view, uh, there was a revolution. So physicists care about fundamental things and eventually the molecules, the atoms and what's inside the nucleus. But at some point, understanding what's happening around us becomes irrelevant uh, with the elements, the deeper you go. It's actually how, the, uh, the, the, the elements we understand well organized with each other, that's actually more fun. So there was an article in 70s that marks the revolution of uh, condensed matter physics so called uh, more is different from a, from a, a, a renowned physicist then. 
saying that simply having more of the fundamentals will make many different changes. Say, understanding perfectly well about the mind of a single person doesn't let you know about economy or sociology or politics, anything, because more is different. And it's the way I bring it out a little bit is because spatial transcriptomics in spatial, it's a one fundamental issues we try to tackle is high throughput. Measuring many cells simultaneously in a large tissue section with many genes allows you to achieve something that was never able to before. Okay, so yeah, also good reviews well, by preparing this classes. So I don't think there's textbook yet for this topic, it's too young, but there are reviews written by the uh, actionists, uh, the, the field scientists uh, who are pushing the field forward. Um, so uh, I compacted, uh, compiled uh, 13 reviews so far, and here are the two I liked. And uh, it's all in this link, which I can share with you. I organize using paper pile, uh, but uh, it's just a, a, a paper organization uh, software. Um, it, it's great, but I think it, it you need to pay for it. So I don't, uh, anyway, so well, if you have questions about that, um, I, I'm happy to share you individual review papers if you're interested. Okay, so for, for the next section, uh, let's, I want to organize it in this way. We will be reading three papers uh, that's written by researchers over the last few years, very fresh by the inventors of the technologies themselves. Um, um, so the, uh, three papers, uh, let me actually first send you guys an email about those three papers. So, so we have, so everyone have a copy of them. Uh, you can also search it online uh, by, by their title. Uh, okay, so. Okay, let me send it right now. So you have three attachment, but let's for now just focusing on one paper, uh, which talks about Murfish, that it's a 2015 science paper by Chen et al. titled uh, Spatially Resolved highly multiplex RNA profiling in single cells. Um, you can also just search it in Google, it'll pop up in, in Science Inc. and download the PDFs. Um, and um, we want you to focus on understanding, try to, uh, try to understand how does Murfish work? They talk about, they, they invented Murfish in this paper and especially in their figure one and figure two, A through D. Um, so uh, here are a couple of questions uh, to keep in mind that might help you read through things. So you want to read everything related to figure one and then how, understanding how Murfish work. Uh, so first of all, what does the acronym uh, Murfish stand for? And how many genes can it measure? And uh, which main technical branch we just talked about applies to Murfish? I, I guess it's fairly straightforward. Uh, um, and uh, also, what allowed Murfish to measure many more genes than single molecule fish? As we mentioned, in one round of imaging, you can only measure one gene or just a few. How could Murfish measure many more genes than we could previously? So uh, let's do this maybe. Um, uh, let me give you five minutes uh, uninterrupted uh, individual reading time. And you try to read everything as much as possible. Um, and uh, come up with questions if you don't, don't understand part of it. And then for the next 10 minutes, let's have an open discussion. And I'll take into questions from you guys and we can walk over the figures uh, all together. And then at the end, there will be a mini quiz. Uh, it won't be graded, don't be nervous, um, but uh, the winner might get a t-shirt. I'll ask for it, I, I, I'm not certain yet. Uh -huh. Okay, so, okay. It's 2.32 right now, so let's give you um, five minutes to 2.37. First of all, uh, does everyone get the paper already, either by searching or by email? Uh, okay, um, yeah, let me know if you haven't. Um, then let's get started.
Okay, we are we are at about uh, five minutes. I I hope to give you more time if you need it. Uh, what's the? Yeah, I, I can't gauge how fast you get. Different people have different uh, speed. Uh, um, so Jonathan, what do you feel? Uh, well, I I took the pictures and read some of the captions. Okay, I understand already. Oh, okay, so great, 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 great. Um, Maybe okay, well, let's give everyone two more minutes. Let's start at uh, two forty. Then um, it's obvious. It, it's challenging, obviously. And uh, if you don't understand something, try to come up with questions. Uh, that's that might help you uh, understanding it. So part of this research is to know what you don't know about exactly. <laughs> um,
Okay. Um, yeah, let, let's get started. And uh, so first of all, um, any questions um, from you guys? Um, if you have any, um, we, we can start from there. Um, Maybe you could explain the significance of handling distance, why that's important. Okay. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, how about we pull? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so um, let me pull the papers. out directly. Um, so I guess I need to stop share and reshare this paper. Okay, so for those of you online, can you see now uh, uh, the paper I'm presenting? Or is, is this, okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, Okay, let's take a look at Murfish. Um, so someone asked about Hemming distance. Why do we care about it? So uh, first of all, let's let's probably uh, dive into uh, uh, figure one a. Okay, <laughs> so let's try to understand it. What's what's happening there? Um, so you see a, a bunch of weird shaped thing, uh, which is cell. <laughs> so each cell is subjected to repeated rounds of imaging. So image one, image two, three, four, up until n. Let's focus on this point. So I previously drew a cell, which is less weird than the shape of this, but it's a cell. And they have uh, mRNA molecules floating around. Um, but what's unique about it are those numbers inside cells. So you see, if you zoom really into it, for imaging one, all molecules, all mRNAs, were assigned a, a number, either zero or one. Uh, so, and with zero, there's some <laughs> a yellowish ball around it. It means it, it, there's a fluorophore there that sends off a light signal. You can pick it up from, from, from imaging. Uh, whereas in the zero part, it's all dark. Uh, you have nothing there. Okay, so uh, what's happening there is in imaging one, moly, uh, mRNAs were assigned, part of mRNAs were assigned to signal either by darkness or by light. Uh, uh, light means one, darkness means zero, okay? So let's advance to image two. What's happening there is, um, again, uh, you added a second digit to every individual molecule. And now if we focus on the second one, whenever there's a one, it's light. Whenever there's zero, it's darkness, okay? Um, but it's by combining the two images from image one and image two, for each molecule, you actually get two digit, two digit uh, binary barcode. You could, you, you could, it could take uh, four different combinations. So zero, one, one, zero, 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 one, one, actually four different combinations. So then in the image three, it adds a third digit to it. Or again, if you focus on the third digit, whenever there's a one, there's a light uh, around it indicating it's picked up only in this image three. And then you can do it repeatedly each in each imaging um, round, uh, you assign uh, a binary barcode to uh, the original mRNA molecules. And by combining all n different rounds of imaging, each uh, barcode actually, oh, sorry, each molecule gets assigned a, a n bit barcode. That's the idea. So why do we want to do that? So originally, uh, in single molecule fish, in each time you measure one gene, then in n time you measure at most n genes. That's that's it. But the strategy here is using the power of combinatorial number. So if you use one bit, you can separate two things. But the one, uh, if you have two bit, you have four different combinations. So that's one, 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 zero, 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 one, one, zero. If you have three bit, you have eight different numbers at your disposal. So it's, so if you are familiar with mathematics, in theory, what's going on is with n bit, you can separate two to the n's different uh, things. Okay, two, 
uh, that's that increases quite a, uh, by a lot. So if you if say just uh, take a few number and if n equals one, this gives you two. N equals two gives you four. N equals three, eight, four, then sixteen. N equals five, thirty-two, six, fifty-four. And using seven bits, you can measure one hundred twenty-eight. So yeah, in, 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 ten two to the tens is a thousand actually. There are only 50,000 at most genes in the whole genome. So pretty much you will reach that number. And um, that's, that's the hope uh, of Murfish by multiplexing, right? If you're pulling information across different rounds of imaging, you're able to resolve things in a much more powerful way than just one at a time, okay? Um, so yeah, that's what they mean. In the end, by using those barcodes, they, they were able to discern A, B, C, D, E, F, G, different kinds of genes by those barcodes, okay? So that was the hope. Um, uh, questions? Yeah. You don't need to design new flow. Yeah, yeah, good question. You don't need to design new flow for, you need to design new probes each time that binds to different section, different uh, mRNA species, same, pro, uh, same flow form. So, so if it's, uh, I mean, if there's like, if every RNA molecule leads to a unique probe. Yes. Does that mean that we just inject this with 50,000 probes every time? Or... Uh, good question. Yeah, I think that's talked about. How they actually implement it, it requires more things, yeah. yeah. It's how they talked about it coming down in panel E, which is very complex, but hopefully let's come to that. Yeah, yeah. A short answer is you, you need two parts of probe. One is called the encoding probe, which directly binds to the mRNA sequence unique for every gene, and readout probe, which, which is more related to the each imaging run. And you need to design their combination in a in a smart way so that you can achieve this thing. You can achieve randomly assign hopefully half of your mRNA species differently in each imaging round, okay? Um, okay, that's panel A. So how does a uh, Hamming distance come into place? So uh, that's what's shown in B, C, and D. So uh, by the way, uh, why is scientific paper so hard to read? Because one thing is short, it has to be terse. Journals have the page limit. For another, those scientists and inventors are field experts. They are writing these papers to other experts to hopefully convincing them are powerful new tool or new arguments. Um, it's, not a, it's not written to beginners to, to teach you how to do this step and that. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's why scientific paper is hard to read. But yeah, over time, you, you kind of get it because we, we will pick up and become experts ourselves. Um, so BCD, the three different curves, they didn't label it. So what does the black line mean? What does the blue line mean? What does the red? It's actually mentioned in the caption. So they said uh, black indicates a simple binary code that includes all two, two to the n minus one possible binary words. That that's what we uh, mentioned. But um, but blue indicates Hamming distance for HD4 code, and uh, and purple indicates a different code MHD4, uh, which represents a different thing. So yeah, the key to understand is uh, what's Hamming distance and why do we need to modify it and so on. So yeah, so let's let's think through the argument we had. If we take a combinatorial barcode to, with two to the n possibility, you assign each different gene with one barcode from this two to the end. Uh, will that work? In theory, it should work, but in practice, they don't. They kind of want to show it here. Why in practice they don't? Because you could, technologies are never perfect. In each round of imaging, you have small amount of error, say 90% say accurate, 10% messed up. For Single molecule fish, it's okay because you still get 90% correct. But for this kind of thing, errors accumulates in each round so that in the end, if you have 10% error here, 10% error here, 10 then they, the signals bleed into each other. You never resolve anything in the end. That's what's 
what they want to show you. So they assume um, each run have certain uh, small uh, error uh, possibility of error. So uh, uh, first of all, in B, they show how many RNA species it can capture with number of bits. So the, uh, the naive solution is this blue one. You can pretty much capture all of the genes with only a few uh, 30 or um, ish uh, bits. But at the same time, the calling rate or the success rate of capturing EMRNA goes down rapidly because of a small error accumulated in each run. So that's showing this blue curve decreasing rapidly. So from zero to one, the possibility of success, it decreases by a lot over uh, uh, rounds. And misidentification rate, how if, would you misidentify one gene with another because one bit is messed up? Yeah, uh, it will, and it will increase dramatically as you have more and more rounds. Yeah. So, in any of these 10 gene rounds, what constitutes an error? Uh, good question. There are two kinds of error in this kind of things. One is you have a genuine um, mRNA signal, but you didn't capture. Uh, that's that's what we call false negative. Uh, statisticians call it false negative. It should be positive, but it was negative by your measurement. The other one is false positive. Is it should you sh it shouldn't light light up, but for some reason it lights up. Uh, so both of these two error exist. That's why they also need two different measures. One measures false positive, kind of. One measure false negative. False positive means misidentification. False negative means you didn't capture what you're supposed to capture, this uh, calling rate. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's fundamental statistics uh, that's haunting all, all branches of uh, complex data structures. Um, okay, with that, um, they they invented something more smart to 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 deviate from this uh, naive solution, which is still smart but uh, doesn't work. So they invented the purple line, as you can see. It still increase as you uh, uh, increase the number of bits, uh, how many RNA molecules uh, you can use. Uh, but they they were able to control the error rate uh, with. Uh, uh, decently with repeated rounds of imaging. So they, they call it uh, modified, uh, modified Hamming distance four. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, so first of all, Hamming distance just means uh, is a measure of similarity between barcodes. So uh, just one example. Maybe. So if you have two barcodes, uh, one, 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 so it's a three bit barcode, say one, one, one. And the other one is one, one, zero. How similar are they? And, and you can count, compare bit by bit. Are they the same or are they different? So they are same in the first bit, same in the second bit, but different in the third bit. We call it, uh, they have Hamming distance one. So they are different by one bit. Hamming distance four means the, the two barcodes they designed have four bits that are different, okay? So uh, their, their idea is quite simple. So because you have some certain error rate, what if we design the barcodes such that the barcode assigned to different genes all have Hamming distance four means they all have four bit different. So if you mess up one bit, it won't be the end of the world because uh, mess up, messing up one bit allows you to correct it. Only if you m mess up four bit, or uh, actually less than four, two, two bits on either way, you can mis uh, misclassify one kind of gene into another. So that's the idea. Modified Hamming distance four requires all of their barcode system, all genes to be assigned with a barcode that are sufficiently different, different by four. Um, by modified, they also say that each gene only has four ones and all of other zeros. In other words, in repeated rounds of imaging, each gene only light up four times, not more, not less, uh, just four times. But, uh, and they show that computationally, they, they, it all control the error rate, okay? So then 
yeah, in the end, this panel <laughs> e complicate just shows you how they implemented such barcode. Let, let's briefly, uh, it's complex, uh, uh, talk about it. You may have question for sure. You, you may want to read this paper later, but uh, let's go over it uh, roughly. So uh, on the leftmost panel, you have different RNA species, one, two, three, four, up until M. They first do an encoding hive, so they designed unique probes for each gene. Actually, a lot of unique probes for each gene. Uh, you can see each molecule gets bind to many different probes. They shown it's 96 here, 96 here. So each molecule gets bind more than about 200 probes ish. They uniquely bind to these RNA because you designed the probes that specifically cross hybridize to them. Um, but in the, they call it encoding probes, but encoding probes also carry with them two arms that do not match those RNA, but need to be binded by a readout probes next. Um, so that's encoding probes. And the readout sequence, you can choose whatever you want because you are sub not subject to the constraint of biology, which sequence these are. You, you can just put whatever sequences you wanted. And in Actually, they they uh, and then they do then they use readout uh, sequences that uh, specifically binds to those dangling arms of uh, of your encoding probes and uh, with it a uh, 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 fluorescent uh, uh, fluorophore. So then you can image those readout ones. So you arrange the readout probes carefully so that in in the first imaging round or the first readout round. Only these parts of the mRNA, certain uh, mRNA uh, gets light up. And in readout type two, a different proportion of mRNA light up and so on and so forth, type three, type four, up until type one. In the end, you can collect their signal together. So they actually designed this visual quite well. So each row is one species. Each column is one imaging round. You see, this first, if we focus on the first RNA sequence, it's one, one, zero, one, and in the end, the one. So it means it's light up in the first round, in the second round, not the third round, but the fourth round. So you can see if you focus on the first row, indeed, they were lighting up in the first round, in the second round, spared in the third round, and but uh, aligned in the fourth round and the last round. Okay, that's what they're trying to show how they design it. Obviously, it's very complicated. If if I told you this is a principle, you will still think of a lot of details about how to implement this. Yeah. Just a Sorry. Question. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I guess, uh, yeah, whoever is online. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so if I may, I may have missed it. What does the color mean? What is... Uh... Oh, great question. Uh, color just represents different imaging rounds. But in reality... Uh, they, they are not using different fluorophores across different rounds. They are reusing the same color to actually image. This is just a visual to separate a different imaging round. In and this and what is the advantage or disadvantage of using the same fluorophore versus you know, using multiple? Oh, I think using multiple fluorophore doesn't, uh, oh, is, is, is always better, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, this is just assuming in each uh, in imaging round, you only have one color at your disposal, but you can actually do more color, but uh, you, can, you can think about more color as a more image, more channel in your bit system without actually need to be uh, imaged twice. Or um, so, so, yeah, but the scheme you know, to avoid complexity, you, you just don't distinguish them. So repeated imaging, can be replaced by more colors, if that makes sense. Got it, thanks. Um, but, but yeah, one fundamental limit about imaging is you don't have too many colors. <laughs> so yeah, but uh, you can have many imaging rounds or at least 30 or so. I think when they actually implemented, they indeed use multiple colors and multiple rounds, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. So my question is, with more rounds of hybridization, does that increase the error rate for later bits? Um, good question. 
Um, so you were asking, uh, does the first few bits equivalent to the to the last few bits in quality and stuff? Uh, good question. I don't have immediate answer to it. Uh, I think it does degrade by a by a bit, uh, but not a lot to, to uh, still allow them to do it. One way of characterizing it is so. How much do we know that if does the first round has the same quality as the last round? One way to do it is to measure the same gene, same bits in the first and the last round and see if they match with each other. I, I think when, when people develop the technology it characterizes, uh, they have to show it's still pretty good. Some, some RNA is degraded over tens of rounds of imaging, but still pretty good. So yeah, you can reliably interpret your data. Yeah, yeah that's a good question. Um, Okay, anything else? Um, okay, w with that, um, let's, um, yeah, let me reshare uh, this uh, uh, keynote. Okay, we, we, t we talked about uh, MERFISH and how they implement MERFISH. And by the way, figure two is just experimental data. They show each point is one RNAs. And with repeated rounds of imaging, the same point gets light up uh, in different rounds uh, if you focus on one. And in the end, uh, they, they collect the bits uh, uh, across different rounds. So, but, uh, so we explained this. And so, yeah, let's, let's uh, take a mini quiz and it's gonna be fun. Um, so please go to kahoot.it. So I'll also bring it up on my side. Yeah, it, this is just for fun and uh, don't be nervous. Um, classical mode. Okay, okay, so then enter the game pin, I guess. Uh, I haven't tried, uh, maybe start, no waiting for players. Yeah, so once you go there, please, uh, yeah, I see one person, uh, enter the pin and there are a few questions and we can, uh, a few polls if you want. <laughs> Let's wait for one minute before we get started. Okay, are there anyone else who wants to join but haven't? What, uh, what is uh, the game pin? I was wondering what the game pin is. Is it in the email? Oh, no, it's it's on my screen. I just see kahoot.it. Oh, sorry for the, oh, I oh, didn't. Oh, no worries. Yeah, yeah, good, good question. Uh, I didn't share my uh, web browser. So only those here are, uh, knows what, what's happening. Um, new share. Okay, how about now? Yes, I can see it now. Okay, okay, yeah. Sorry, yeah. That that's why you need to speak up because I. Thanks. Okay, let's get started. Um, okay, wh what does MERFISH stand for? Uh, this is just to get you guys familiar with this system. Um, okay, everything get it right. Uh, everyone get it right. It's multiplexed, error robust uh, fish. Uh, um next okay scoreboard that's nice now we are getting into the real questions murfish is the natural extension of which technology okay i think it's going too fast but oh but yeah everyone answered it single molecule fish rather than sequencing it's by imaging 
What's the spatial resolution? Something we missed, but uh, it's quite important. Um, okay, it's single molecule resolution. Um, five of you guys get it right. Let's pause it for, 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 for a while. Why is it single molecule resolution, not single cell resolution, not a few cell? Obviously, it's not a few cell, it's, it has single cell. Right? Why do we have to have it single molecule? That's actually critical. Yeah. So, probes bind to the molecule. That's one thing. Uh, another thing is you want to make sure, so from the demand perspective, I guess, in order to combine different runs of barcode, you need to, in each round, resolve, know which barcode belong to which. Where do you light it up? Not confusing with each nearby molecules flowing around. Otherwise, the whole system just breaks. That's from the demand perspective. You need to have really high resolution imaging to know where each single mRNAs are, not just where they are roughly in the cells, uh, because you need to match different rounds of imaging. Uh, also, from the experimental perspective, it's still feasible because uh, uh, the limit of a light uh, microscopy uh, is fundamentally limited by the wavelength of the light, which is uh, a few hundred nanometers, which happens to be okay to, to resolve many of the mRNAs. Um, in some cases, there there won't uh, th this condition won't be met. Then you have a big problem. Um, okay, um, how many genes can Murfish measure? One to 10, 10 to 100, uh, 100 to 1,000. Yeah, more than a hundred at least. Nowadays, you can do more than a thousand. Uh, or there was one Murfish paper claiming to have ten thousand. Uh, yeah, they shown in their paper this exponential growth of barcoding strategy with a couple dozen uh, imaging. You can resolve a couple hundred, a couple thousand. That's what makes it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I would say one to 10. At most, you may get 100. Uh, yeah, one round of imaging uh, give you one or a few, then you can linearly extrapolate from them. Um, so Murfish doesn't, doesn't measure hundreds of rounds of imaging. Uh, so it, the number of rounds of imaging you're allowed to have is still a couple of dozen. So I guess you can try to brute force uh, measure genes that way. That will give you... Uh, definitely less than 100. <laughs> yeah. You have a chat. Oh, yeah. Thanks for reminding. Okay. Yeah. Someone is typing there. I, I guess we left off someone. So, sorry, Arash. Um, but yeah, thanks for posting. Um, next, what enabled Murfish to measure many more genes than the number of imaging rounds? Yeah, I, I don't think there's a right answer. I think that's, yeah, that's a bad question, uh, way to ask the question. Uh, obviously combinatorial barcoding, but also error robust encoding that allows you to correctly resolve them. So kind of both, but maybe the first one better. Uh, what allowed Murfish to avoid error accumulation due to repeated runs of imaging? Yeah, that's error robust encoding, the hamming, hamming distance for and stuff. What do we expect to see? Oh, something is cut off. Um, oh, uh, no. Uh, yeah, it's correct. What do we expect to see if a gene was assigned the following barcode? Uh, triple one followed by zero, then one, then all of zeros.
Yeah, it'll light up four times because it has four ones. Zero means dark, one means light. Um, and it's the following encoding scheme allowed by Murphish. So for gene one, you have this barcode. For gene two, you have this other. Um, You kind of need to count bit by bit, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, the correct answer is no. Why is that? Because they are not too different from each other. If you, if you compare them bit by bit, so you have four ones here, you have three one followed by zero. So the fourth digits are different between these two. And then um, they are all zero afterwards. So they are only differ by one bit. Um, so that's not sufficient enough to distinguish, uh, to, to, to allow error robust encoding. So in their scheme, they, every two genes need, the barcode they assign need to be we need to have four digits that are different between them. So no. Okay, so that's all that's about Murfish. Murfish is part one big branch and one leading technology of spatial transatomics. So yeah, any question? Uh, do we need to take a pause here? Um, let me let me actually. Oh, by the way, who uh, who's JP? <laughs> who's JP? Uh, John Jonathan, I guess. Um, uh, who's, yeah, congratulations everyone for it's doing good. Um, so let me stop share and reshare. Um, let, let's dive into the second uh, technology, which is complementary to Murfish, uh, another important branch. So reading section two, and we can take a break if you want uh, at what, while you're reading. So it's the second PDF I share with you. Uh, Rodrigues uh, at all 2019 science, you can also search the title SlideSeq, a scalable technology for measuring genome-wide expression at high spatial resolution. Uh, same question, how does SlideSeq work? Um, and it's in there, figure one. And the questions, um, which technology uh, SlideSeq was uh, evolved from and what's the spatial resolution, how many genes, and what allows it to encoding to encode spatial resolution. So figure one is like this, but you can pull it up. Um, so let's take say five minutes. Uh, um, I'm reading the second paper very quickly and try to understand as much as possible. And also feel free to take a break. <laughs>
Okay, I kind of lost count of time, but I guess it's about time. Um, yeah, again, any questions from you guys? Uh, Yes. If you look at figure B, it's talking about the process of nutrition. There's a slide that says tissue digestion. And it just, is, that, is that like just a way of everything except the mRNA? Because they still need to have more administration. Uh, yeah, good question. Tissue digestion means uh, removing everything other than mRNA. And <laughs> that's the sure. show want to get other things out of the way so you can then collect mRNAs later. Yeah, okay, let, let's go over the figure panels a little bit. So slide seek, what, what does it mean? For one, the seek means it's a sequencing technology. They want to use sequencing. Uh, for sequencing, you need to ultimately collect mRNA molecules into a tube and then send it into a sequencing machine to know their sequence. So that's kind of at the end of panel B. So, the key is panel A and panel B, by the way. C and D, they just show off their data. Um, so, but how do you turn from a brain section with spatial information and ultimately collect uh, things into a tube and still know where they were from? That's the question. So how they do it is they, so they have a slide um, uh, or a surface barcoded with beads, they and, 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 and from this illustration, it's ten micron sized beads that are packed, uh, 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 everything near e each other. Um, and then on this, on uh, in one layer on the surface, then they do in situ indexing, which if you read about it, it's a complex way uh, of it's it's or it, it's an in, in situ sequencing technology, which by itself is pretty complex, but um, it's a way of knowing uh, for each bead uh, what uh, DNA barcodes they carry. So each bead has a unique barcode that are different from other beads, and you want to know their code and relate that to uh, their spatial location. Um, so that's what they're trying to show. Um, and for in one round, they actually do that with imaging. So. For one round of imaging, you can resolve uh, one uh, sequ one letter in your DNA sequence. We know DNA have four different possible letters, A, T, G, Cs. That's why you see four different colors if you actually count it. Uh, so each round you get A, T, G, C, but you have many rounds. It's a barcode, again, uh, unique barcode for each bead. Then you, you save this. You, now you have a lookup table between the uniquely barcoded beads uh, versus their spatial location. So then you 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 section the brain and you uh, into thin section and put it onto the slide. And you need to transfer the mRNA from the tissue section to the surface. Uh, so then each mRNA gets captured by one bead. Uh, and but for one bead, it can capture many different mRNAs that are low code to that bead. Um, then you do RT. RT means reverse transcription, which is just, is another way of saying uh, once you capture the mRNA, you you want to translocate it on the bead. Um, and then uh, tissue digestion, removing everything else. Then you pull mRNAs, uh, the the RNAs you captured and reverse transcribed into a tube. Now again, each sequence carries uh, two pieces of information. One is what this mRNA is about. The other is what that barcode is in, for, the, uh, for the bead that captures those mRNAs. So you can pull it and sequence it and um, parse it in the end, the sequence one part to this lookup table you created previously to know where they were and the other part is mapped to the genome to know which gene they were. So, yeah. Someone has their hand raised. Oh, uh, yeah, please go ahead, chat. Um, does each bead represent one cell? Great question. Um, it's not guaranteed because, um, yeah, each bead is about the size of one cell. If it's densely packed, everything goes normal. You hope 
is each bead is above oneself. But if some region is denser, some region is looser, you have variability. Some bead gets a couple of cells. Yeah. Um, but um, another thing is during this, this transferring step, there could be diffusion in mRNA molecules to the surrounding neighborhood that also contaminated. So I guess the short answer is it, it's not a single cell, single cell. It's a few cells, but you can regard it similar conceptually as a single cell. But it's actually a mixture of their local environment. Yeah, great question. Um, okay, anything else? Any any confusions about this? Um, let's maybe take a look at C and D again. So C and D just shows you actual tissue sections that they were able to resolve uh, for di uh, different regions uh, with different cell types. Uh, so these are all different brain regions, hi hippocampus, cerebellum, olfactory bulb, et cetera. But obviously you can apply it to different tissues. Okay, one more chat. Oh, got it. Okay, great. With that, uh, let's go to the second quiz. Um, uh, again, it's Kahoot It. Uh, let me make sure I share this time. Um, how do I get back? Okay, here's the game pin, uh, 9445334. Okay, we already have 10 hertz people. Um, yeah, let's get started. Um, Again, just to make sure everyone is on board uh, before we actually go into it. Uh, slide means transferring RNA order to a surface barcoded with DNA beads. Um, slide seek is the extension of which one? Yeah, exactly. Sing single cell, uh, single molecule fish is for merfish. Uh, single cell RNA seq, uh, yeah, is for slice seq. Except in slice seq, single cell actually knows where they are in the in the tissue section, uh, but it's no longer single cell uh, strictly speaking. Someone has asked. Uh, this question just before. Yeah, realistically, it's a few cell. Uh, I know it's 10 micron in bead size, but practically it's always going to be a bit, <laughs> a bit, uh, uh, less accurate than that. Uh, there's usually a few cells. It could be a mixture. Um, how many genes can it measure?
yeah, more than 10,000. Because it doesn't select, and it, there's no cap in the number of genes it can measure. It, and it's another way of asking how many genes are there, period, in, in the system you're investigating. And usually it's a bit more than 10,000 genes in, in the mammalian genome, whether mouse or human. What allowed uh, SlideSeq to retain spatial information using sequencing? Yeah, that's right. Everyone get it right. I don't need to explain it. What limits its uh, spatial resolution? Yeah, that's right, beat size. Actually, over time, since the publication, SlideSeq is not the first paper who does, uses strategies for spatial encoding. Before SlideSeq, there are methods called, literally called spatial transcriptomics because then it was the only one. Uh, but later on, it was commercialized called 10X Visium and stuff. They, they used the larger beads, it's 50 micron instead of 10 micron. But after SlideSeq, there were, a finer bead size with similar principles, microarrays and stuff. And you can, so the limit is on bead size. Uh, okay, last one. Uh, what can affect data quality? That's right. So actually as a computational biologist myself, I never do experiments. I, I hand waved how it's done, but it's very difficult in each tiny bit of step. Here it's, you want to transfer mRNAs from cells from tissues onto a surface. That process is actually tricky and inefficient. Usually you capture five to 10% while, while carefully doing everything. So if you lost everything in this transfer, ring step, you obviously don't get anything at all. So the second answer, tissue autofluorescence, is more of a problem with imaging-based thing. So for MERFISH, you want to detect your signal that's from mRNAs, but if you have tissue autofluorescence from other things, lipid proteins that smear around and pollute your uh, visual uh, photos, that will affect your, uh, your data quality, but not for this one. Okay, um, yeah, uh, that's it. Congratulations, uh, DPCF and 6475. <laughs> uh, this is great job. Okay, um, let me see. So it's 3.30, so we have two options. So I have prepared one other method called star map. Which, a little, which is a little bit of both. Uh, they use in situ sequencing combined with imaging, we use barcoding. It's kind of a little bit uh, both. Let me, let me share uh, first. So yeah, actually, uh, so it's the third PDF, but for the time being, um, let's uh, probably skip this one. We did enough reading about it. If you care about it, we can, Go back, uh, star, uh, star map is another milestone and they, they claim they can do 3D imaging. So, so far we, we've been dealing with 2D thin sections of tissue uh, imaging. So when we mean spatial information, actually it's 2D spatial information, X and Y with no third dimension uh, because uh, uh, slide seek, you, you need to make a thin slide and there's no thickness component in it. 
For more fish, you need to do imaging. Imaging requires you to have a very thin section, otherwise light doesn't penetrate through and, and you just, and then you need a focal plane to image things. So, but um, yeah, for 3D it's actually quite challenging. They need to do some other innovations, but let's skip that for now because we do want, this is a quantitative uh, workshop. Uh, tomorrow we will be dealing with more coding, mm -hmm. but I want to get our hands wet today for uh, and just and talk. Yeah, go ahead. Um, is there a question? Uh, okay, let me know if you have question. You can put it in the comment or something. Um, so yeah, let's get into uh, the topic. So that's so so far. It's what is uh, spatial transomics? Why do we care about it? How does it work? And we mentioned a lot of details about how the technology works. So now let's talk about how do we process the data? How do we analyze it? And uh, very briefly in the final, I guess, hour, but I, I don't think we'll last for an hour. <laughs> I need to pick for my, pick up my kid, <laughs> unfortunately. But I do want to reserve some time for questions and, and stuff. So. Yeah, let's talk about the data processing. Very briefly, um, this is how Murfish data processing works. So you start from a raw image, uh, raw stack imaging. Uh, so for the same field of view, you image them repeatedly because each round you collect different information about things, uh, uh, about same molecules. So uh, bit one, sorry, vertical, bit one, bit two, bit three, bit four, up until bit 16. So they, they for this uh, particular thing, they imaged uh, 16 bits. By, by stacking them together, you can create a table of spots by X, Y, Z, sorry, X, Y, for now, uh, let, let's assume, and by bit one through bit 16, whether it's zero or one. Uh, spot means just one light uh, dot here. Every light dot here corresponds to a spot in your table. You can know for the same location whether it's on or off across 16 bit. So from images, you can collect spot table by registration and spot column. Then you can decode it because you pre assigned the barcode system for iMRNA molecules. From those 16 bit barcodes, you can know which gene they were from, actually. So uh, uh, for each individual spot now is called a transcript because we know their molecular identity in those genes. So transcript table. And then you want to summarize this information. So this, this is now single molecule resolution, gene expression, spatial uh, measurement, whatever. But you, uh, what we actually care about most of the time is to summarize uh, molecules into cell and know for each cell where they are and how many genes for each type of gene you measured that cell has you, you measured. So you, to summarize from transcript table to cell table, you just need to circle area in your images, which part belongs to wells or which cell. So here's an image as they, they put circles around this region. So all of the transcripts inside this circle are summarized and counted uh, to be belong to cell or stuff. So in the end, from images to cell table, you get this uh, uh, for each row is one cell, their location and how many genes they express for the gene you measure. Okay? So that's one thing. Um, how, how about sequencing based method? And um, so it's, so the raw data, it's not actually raw data, it's also imaging, but it's images in the sequencing machine that they never show you and no one look at it. But uh, the raw uh, output from the sequencing machine is a lot of sequencing reads, uh, a, a lot of letters, ATGCs. Then each read, you need to demultiplex it uh, because each read has two sections, each contain a different information. For one section, it can be mapped to the genome to know which gene they belong to. For another section, you look it up their uh, spatial coordinates because you have them already in slide seek, if you remember. 
So which spot they belong to in the end, um, one spot, now spot in this case is roughly means one cell or a few cells in your, or a bead in your technology. For each spot, you know their location, you know how many genes they have. So again, you arrive at this cell by, by location, by gene count matrix. That's what, uh, that's what we care about next. Uh, uh, okay, so then from that point, so and here's a summary, uh, a different way of visualizing the same thing. So for each cell, each cell is a row, you, uh, you have their spatial location X or Y and uh, expression level for, you, uh, for different genes, or you count how many genes, gene, uh, copies gene one has, how many copies gene two have. So what can we do with it? Um, um, we will talk about complex analysis tomorrow, but for today, uh, just let's think, what can we do with this kind of data? Um, one straightforward way uh, of doing this so, um, is to plot, just focus on one gene at a time, say gene one, we know their X and Y, we wonder what's their spatial resolution, uh, spatial distribution of that gene, uh, one gene across uh, across the tissues, right? So you often, that's what I, the plot I show you in the very beginning, we have a mouse spring section, they, uh, they colored 30 different genes, but what if we just plot one gene? What's their distribution, where they were expressed in the brain, something like that. So for that, uh, let's do, um, a quick coding, I'll do a coding demo and walk, walk you through it. Uh, but I also want you to participate there. Um, two ways of doing it. W one option is to go to Google Collab Tree and create a new Python notebook and start typing. Coding is about typing and you have the right tool then you can do it. Option two is you copy from this template notebook. You, uh, you can't click this link, but I, I shared with you uh, uh, in my email uh, at the beginning of the class. You can just click that, make a copy. So once you click this, you will see something like this and you can select copy to drive and that's your own copy. So you can mess up with it. Um, and how to set up the data set. So here um, uh, I selected one data po uh, posted uh, by VizGen, which is a comp Murfish company. They try to sell Murfish machines and technologies. They released their data V1.0 in May, 2021. I just streamlined it, simplified it. Then you can download it uh, uh, through this Google Drive link. And this link is also in the, uh, in the Jupyter Notebook. If you copy it, it you'll see uh, this link inside and that lets you, uh, uh, do this. Okay. Um, any questions? I guess I can wait uh, uh, two minutes or so. Let me know if you can do this. Um, but um, let me go. Uh, the goal is, so yeah, uh, Mar Mara raised hand. Hi. Um, yeah. Um, I don't see the link in the collab template. Um, is there any oh. way you can just post the link in the chat or something? Oh yes, I can post it in chat. Uh, okay, uh, just for the um for the data set, I have the link to the okay, just for the data. The data um, yeah, let me. Mira, if you go down to iteration four, you see the link. Oh, okay. I I figured it was at the top. Oh, okay. Never mind. Thank you. I yeah, no problem. Then. Yeah, thanks for speaking up. Um, yeah, I also just posted in the chat. Uh, um, before we dive into it, uh, let me just give you a high level of what our goal in the next 30 minutes made are, and then we'll conclude for today and we, we restart tomorrow. So we were handed off a data like this, a data table like this. That, that seems straightforward. We want to plot their spatial distribution for one gene. So this gene I selected is called SLC1787. Uh, it's my favorite gene for, for this class. Um, well, the ideal goal is to show where they are light up, where they are expressed in this tissue, in this brain section. It's, it's mouse brain, cut it this way. Um, yeah, this is our goal. 
But how do we make it? How do we make a scatter plot that seems so simple from scratch using the data we have? Okay, uh, we can start from here. There, there's one command in Python. Uh, PLT is a it means uh, matplotlib is a shorthand for matplotlib pyplot. Uh, we will come to that. And it allows you to make a scatter plot if you have a list of x and y's. Uh, so each dot is a cell, you know their coordinates. So if you make this plot, it looks like this. <laughs> uh, uh, if you try it on our raw data, how do we go from here to here? So that's the goal. So I want you to try it a little bit and try to resolve it. If you're really good at coding, this is not a problem, but it, this is just to help um, um, you guys recap what's needed. And uh, there's a lot of subtleties in it. Uh, as I said, the devil is in the details. To actually make, make it good and representative of the actual data is not that easy. <laughs> it doesn't sound as trivial as uh, you might think. Uh, and here I also listed a few problems you might encounter just for your reference, um, but you will come to that. Um, okay, let, let's, um, oh, before I switch to the, to the demo, um, uh, also uh, for some of you, so th this is a diverse class. I know some of you is very good at coding and this won't be a problem for you at all. So in order to make it fun for you and challenging, then here's a bonus coding exercise. So we talked about Murfish right, um, in class and how uh, modified Hamming distance flow works in general, but how does it actually work? So here's some numbers. So if you use a spark, uh, a 18 bit barcodes to encode genes, a naive solution is you have two to the 18 possible combinations, minus one because Zero, 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 zero is all dark. It doesn't mean anything. Um, but uh, in MDHD4 system implemented by Murfish, only four out of the 18 bits are allowed to be ones. So think about it. How many barcodes satisfy this constraint? You can calculate it uh, with one step with combinatorial numbers, if you're familiar with it. But also, you want the Hamming distance between every pair of barcodes to be greater than or equal to four. No two barcodes are sufficiently similar. How can you create a system of barcodes that satisfied uh, by both of these constraints? And for 18-bit, how many of those barcodes you can create? Um, I tried to wrestle with this problem myself. I couldn't come up with a simple answer. I think um, uh, one straightforward way of doing it is if you're good at coding, you can try it, you can try generate random barcodes and test if they satisfy these two things or try to let them satisfy two things and see how many of them are compatible in the end. It's actually not a trivial number, I think. Um, I, I can be far from random. Okay, that's for the bonus point. But now I think um, the last uh, business of this uh, uh, today's workshop is to to go back to this. How do we go from there to here, uh, the above to the bottom? Um, um, and let's do that. Um, for that, uh, I'll create a notebook myself. Uh, uh, first, I'll, I'll give you a few minutes while I'm setting it up to try it. Okay, um, so yeah, feel free to play with it if you know this, but just to catch up with everyone, um, if you're unfamiliar with how to code in Python and what a Jupyter Notebook is, um, so here are individual cells, uh, they contain code. Yeah, in order to run it, you just hit uh, return 
and shift, shift plus return. It just runs through the first cell. And it happens to be some packages we need to import and some setup. And then you can similarly run through the second one. It's a function I defined, I wrote that uh, you can use later, but we, we, will, we will talk about it. Um, so the title of this uh, exercise is uh, how to make a scatter plot uh, and how to iteratively make a better one uh, from the sim most simple case to the to the next. Um, again, just to, just a review. You don't have to pay attention if you know this. Uh, the first thing is to try if we can make a scatter plot using any kind of data. You just throw in random numbers. Here I throw in x is uh, one two three four y one two three three and you make a scatter plot and it works. You just, it just tests out your command. You know how to use a command. Um, it creates four numbers uh, because X has four numbers, Y has four numbers. So similarly, you can, you can do whatever, say you add numbers to it. Um, negative one, negative three, negative five. Similarly, for y, you can do 10, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, and you can plot it. You see now you have more numbers. That's iteration 1, make a minimalist scatter plot. If you think about each cell, each dot is a, is a cell, it just shows the anatomy, essentially. Um, so next, we worry about how do we add a color on top of each dot? That color is supposedly represent the gene expression level for the gene we care. So, yeah. Um, so you need a third vector. So X is a vector, Y is a vector, a third vector that shows uh, the gene expression level. So you, th there's a command in scatterplot that allows you to do it. So uh, other than X and Y, you need to specify C. C means color. So you just put C equals gene there and you go, oh, uh, unexpected intent, uh, in, indent, mm. then you go, yeah. Um, now you can see each dot has a different color uh, because the, their gene expression level we put in are different from each other. So that's a minimalist spatial transcriptomics plot. If each dot is a cell, each uh, color. Iteration three, so what does the color actually mean? Color should always be accompanied by a color bar. So we'll figure out how to add a color bar in this iteration. So um, how do we do that? Um, so I write it down for, and also control some figure element, uh, the figure size. So you want to do scatter again, x, y, and with c equals gene. Um, and, and you add a command got, called a figure dot color bar parenthesis g g is the plot you just made, and then um, you have a color bar. Now you know this yellowish thing is two, uh, this blue is zero. That matches what our input. Okay, so in the first iteration, we kind of get all the elements needed for actually making a plot. Um, so then we want to you apply it to the real data. That's where download data um, comes into play. Uh, please uh, just um, uh, download it from there uh, and uh, upload it to the Google Collab. Um, anyone have questions uploading this data set? Um, you need to go to the left and click this folder thing and uh, click here, upload. I haven't uploaded for you. Uh, so I have already downloaded it. I just, uh, yeah, uploaded file will be recycled. It'll take a minute, so it's going here. Um, yeah. You have to unzip it first. Oh, you don't have to unzip it. Good. Uh, you can just directly go. But unzip it should be fine. <laughs> um, you just you need to change the file name a little. 
um, when I test it through, uh, I think uh, one of the bottleneck is uploading things. So, I, um, so that's why you don't want to. Okay, I finished mine. So I already typed in how to load this data set. Uh, so you need to know the a path to your file, which happens to be this. And then you use a package called pandas that allows you to read the data table, um, then uh, assign it to data. We'll just run it. Okay, now, now I get my table. Um, uh, any question? Yeah, okay. Um, Okay, now let's try making the plot using the real data. Mm. Maybe I'll pause here for a minute just to wait for everyone to have this set up. Um, also, please uh, feel free to take a break if you need. Um, Uh, yes. So, after having their word said that they can pass about 100 to 400 screen marker with reach. Oh, and uh, I also didn't let me use it there. I see. I think it's because you have some downloading issues. You, you didn't download the files uh, completely. Then you, you have, yeah. Uh, I will just uh, delete everything and retry. Yeah. yeah take your time. Don't worry. Um, It also happens to me. Okay, uh, how many of you guys uh, in this room was able to get this get to this point? Uh, okay, one, two, three. Okay, about half. Uh, I guess one more minute. Um, if you were unable, uh, don't worry about it. Um, I, I can calm down and help you. Um, And it's also a dry run for for tomorrow. So this will be the this data set will be the one we play around with um, tomorrow. Okay, um, let's get started a little bit. Uh, so first of all, uh, we have made a plot in iteration three, just on some uh, simulated data, some random number we typed in. Um, we, we just want to apply it to our real data. So what do we do? We first copy everything from the, our successful example last time and rerun it here, down here. So we reproduced it, what's the big deal? And um, now we worry about how to collect the right data. So we have X and Y and gene. We just want to replace X and Y and gene with the real numbers from this data table. So yeah, it's, it's a little bit of uh, coding uh, in organizing data table and understanding this pandas package in Python. So what we can do is actually pretty simple. We just re uh, re reassign X by this data with the column x, because you see the first column in data is called x, which is the x coordinate. Similarly, we do y equals data uh, y, the y column. And for the gene, we care about um, 
And so there are four, over 400 genes in this table. Uh, for the gene I will be using uh, is, let me call it gene name, is H, uh, SLC, capital S, uh, lowercase lc, uh, 1787. And uh, you don't have to choose just this gene, but this happens to be the gene I want to use. Um, and then um, uh, we want to color it by, by uh, by this column, so it's data uh, gene name, um, or another way of doing it, data uh, select this gene in particular, uh, SLC seventeen A seven, and assign it to a new variable. Let me call it gene expression G E X P, whatever you want. Um, okay, then let's check if it works. Let's see what X. Uh, so what the shape of X is, what the shape of Y is, what the shape of uh, uh, gene is. Okay, if we run it, it's about right. It has 80,000 X position, 80,000-ish Y and G expression, because that's the number of cells you have in this data. And if you just want to show um, X, what they actually is, is a long list of numbers, okay? Um, now we are ready to send this in to the plotting function. Uh, so with this scatter plot, you, you have X and Y and C used to equal gene, but then to avoid confusion, I renamed it already. It's called GEXP. Um, actually, let me shrink it so you can see better. Maybe. Uh, um, so. C is the gene expression level, which we defined in here called GEXP. So let's just type it in C equals GEXP, X and Y we have already uh, redefined. Okay, then just, uh, we can just do it. let it run. It'll take a few seconds because there are a lot of cells. Okay, in the end, you get something like this. It looks like a brain vaguely, but it's very crowded. And with the color bar and everything goes from zero to 500 for that gene. Um, okay, that's our first step, <laughs> applying a scatter plot to a real data, okay? Um, so you, you do see X and Y coordinates, you see individual cell represented by dots and uh, dots are colored by different uh, uh, colors representing gene expression level. But the problem is, uh, the, I guess, what's the problem? Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Jeff. Is the marker size too big? Right, right, right. Marker size too big is, yeah, is a problem uh, because you have so many cells uh, here. Um, that's one problem. So too many dots, too crowded, or figure not big enough. You can either increase figure size or increase. Right. Um, then, um, also, what's the range of gene expression? It goes from zero to 500, but only a few cells seem to be at 500-ish with uh, many other cells that's below. So we want to investigate this a little bit. As to, it's, in real world data, it's very uh, easy to have outliers because of technical errors and stuff that if you have a few points, that has expression level extremely higher than all the other things, it'll drive your plot away from being meaningful. So a few cells with 500 will remove anything, any real or whatever um, dynamic range that's actually happening between zero to 100. So, because zero and 100 are showing up in, as, as a similar number. Okay, um, so these are the questions uh, we want to address. So let me walk you through a little bit. How do we evolve from here? So again, let's copy from our progress, copy everything we had up to now uh, and reproduce it um, below. Um, and um, don't worry about uh, recording everything. Um, in the end, I will give you a full solution that that uh, takes you step by step to how to solve this. You, uh, you can kind of see from this title, I call it uh, day one template, but crippled template. That's because I first created the whole thing, then I crippled it. Uh, but uh, yeah, you will have a full solution. Uh, um, so, okay, we reproduced it. 
Um, that's the first step. The next thing we want to tackle is to make the point size smaller. How do we do it? Um, so here it's actually suggesting you. So here are the parameters uh, automatically popped up that shows you how to use the scatter function better. So you can scroll through and find uh, here, um, th there's this one parameter called S, uh, optional uh, parameter. Um, it's the marker size, whatever, whatever. So if we tune this S, say S in equals one, let's see what happens. So add one option called X, S equals one. You see it gets better actually because the point size shrinks compared to previously. Um, now you actually see more structures in the brain. Um, so over, over time, I know another problem is uh, you want to add um, edge color equals now, but you don't, uh, that's the detail. So uh, uh, the reason is for each dot here, not only it's big, but also it has a circle around it. It's not visible here in, in this, but it's actually there uh, um, uh, precluding you from shrinking it by too much. So. Yeah, essentially you need this two command um, to make it look like this. Now it's dramatically better, <laughs> I would say, than the last one. Um, now you actually see the structure of brain, hippocampus and stuff. Um, one question is how do you get better at this? Um, that requires a lot of Googling practice, read the documentation of how to use scatter plot and stuff. Uh, just to show you a little bit, one command you can use is called a uh, question mark. So the command we, we are dealing with is plt.scatter. You could do plt.scatter question mark. Now it gives you um, this help function that describes how this function works, what are the options, what things you can do. That's one way. Another way is to Google um, and search for the full documentation for this function. Um, um, questions up to now? Um, okay. Um, yeah, let's go for it. So we kind of solved this crowding issue. And now we actually see different regions of the brain dense parts and less dense part. So that's a good thing. Um, but we still have the problem of probably outliers because we don't see many yellow here. Uh, uh, we see a lot of uh, blue means uh, it looks one, pos two possibility. One possibility is this gene is not actually expressed at all across all cells. That's one possibility. But you do see some differences, subtle differences here. So, uh, but you. Uh, that uh, one other another possibility is if there is some outliers in your data which are far from other cells which uh, drives everything towards more extreme values so we want to investigate that a little bit uh, one way to do it is to make uh, a, a box plot i'll explain what that is but a box plot of all the gene expression so gexp is a gene expression level across all cells uh, th this is how you make a simple box plot uh, and you use another package called a seaborn sns yeah. it, uh, okay now you see every individual values uh, uh, of this gene, uh, the expression level of this gene. Indeed, you, you kind of see there are a few points on the right corner, but most of the points are concentrated in the beginning section. So how you read a box plot, um, so uh, the left end should be the minimum, then comes uh, the 25 percentile, then the median. So median is actually zero, means more than half of the cell has zero count in this gene, but there are a few cells that has minimum meaningful differences uh, between zero and uh, hundred ish, but not between then outliers. Um, box plot is one way. Another way is to do um, uh, histogram. So we we'll, we'll call it histo plot in, in this package. Uh, okay, if you make a histogram, so 
for a different expression level, how many cells has that expression level? You see, uh, I don't know, uh, like a tall uh, block at zero, meaning a lot of cells have zero count, then quickly die down, but doesn't go away until 500-ish. So there are a small fraction of cells that drives everything crazy. So uh, it's a long-tailed uh, distribution that, that's very typical in, in, in a real data. So oh, we are gonna deal with that a little bit. Um, so uh, first of all, um, let's copy uh, from uh, the previous one, rerun it, make sure everything works fine. Um, then we tweak it. So how do we tweak it? Uh, two different ways. One is because we know there are outliers. Let's don't uh, allow, let's uh, set a cap on the color map on uh, how, uh, what value it represents. We could set the maximum color range to be at 100 because that seems to be where most things happening. Um, so that any values that are more than 100 will be at 100, something like that. Okay, how do we do that? So um, we will need another <laughs> uh, option. It's all about reading about the document, how to make a, make a, a scatter plot, uh, called Vmax. Vmax means the value, the maximum value in this uh, scatter plot, uh, in the color map of this scatter plot. Let's keep it at 100, say, um, because that seems to be a reasonable one, and run it again. Oh, now you can see, wow, it's very different because now yellow represents 100 instead of uh, 500. Uh, now you can see structures. This happens to be, uh, uh, so what's highlighting here is actually cortex and hippocampus um, and also different ranges. Okay, that's actually the main thing. We are very close to the final thing. Um, let me pause here and see if you have any questions. Um, and I think this is also a good point where we can end for the day and resume for tomorrow. So obviously we haven't achieved our final goal yet, but it's very close. So what's, what are the missing steps? One is this brain section just doesn't look correct. It's tilted a little bit. Uh, so for in imaging, uh, when I do experiments, uh, <laughs> the brain can be aligned in any, in any directions uh, as you can, but, um, but always we wanted to rotate it uh, to a square in, uh, location uh, or the left and right looks like left and right. So we want to rotate all the cell coordinates into their uh, better looking positions. Um, and that can be achieved by rotation transformation. Uh, and that's also what this function in the beginning is about. Um, and what that, what else uh, we can we can also we also want to label things probably so we want to add a title say this is the gene SLC seventeen eighty seven we want to label the color bar what the color bar means and these kind of things but yeah we we get the main point we can resume from this point and then for tomorrow so now we talked about a naive analysis but that it's actually half of the battle for a complex data analysis is to visualize your raw data as, mu as much as you can and understand what's inside. And but tomorrow we'll go into more detailed uh, computational uh, analysis methods and stuff to see how we can extract information better and uh, get something more than this spatial uh, uh, distribution and gene expression. Okay. Um, okay. Th so that's so much for today. And um, and you're good to go. And um, uh, if you have any question, I'll stay for a few minutes or or so, so we can talk about it. And with that, uh, I'll see you tomorrow if you stay here. If you're still here, I know it's Thanksgiving week and the last day. Uh,
before the break. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, for, for those online, I'm gonna stop uh, sharing. Uh, and Thank you so much. Thank you. Recording.